And now I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker. This morning, to lead off the conference, we are honored to be joined by the Euro European Commissioner for Justice. Uh, Didier Ranger it has risen through the ranks of Belgium government. As you can see, I think his bio is supposed to be on the screen. Um, he, uh, as, is this supposed to be there? Go ahead. As European Commissioner since 2019, he's at the center of the CSDD about both creating it and about implementation. There's no better one to start our program. So now I, from Brussels, will welcome in Commissioner Rangers. You're all set. Okay, so good morning in, uh, in New York, and of course, uh, here's good afternoon, because from Brussels, uh, we're school huge difference, and we have had many meetings yesterday in Brussels with uh, some support for Ukraine in the European Council, but also some discussions in the European Parliament till uh, uh, midnight, so it was a, a long day yesterday, but I'm very pleased to be with you and to uh, take part in such a conference organized by uh, Cornell University and the Global Labour Institute. Of course, you, you discuss today a lot of topics that are at the core of all priorities in the, in the European Union, and certainly um, the priorities of the Commission since the beginning of this mandate, because we have tried to work on two main transitions, uh, the green transition and the digital transition, but all, uh, all in all, we try to work uh, um, to um, have a, mini, um, a more and more sustainable economy. And in such a way, in a sustainable agenda, of course, the, to achieve a, a just and fair development is a primary um, concern uh, in the society, but also in, in the Commission in Europe. And I'm sure it's also your concern for the, the next years. And to promote such a, a just transition, the principle of uh, respecting human rights, including labor rights, uh, and protecting the environment must be um, upheld in all economic sectors, including at global level. And it's not a new um, issue. We have discussed a lot uh, and at length uh, on such a kind of issue in the uh, UN since many years. And of course, these goals fully uh, resonate with the proposed uh, AU legislation on corporate sustainability due uh, diligence. It's a new uh, proposal, it's a directive. Um, and we push uh, uh, such a directive forward to be sure that it's possible to take part in a real action to protect human rights and uh, environment. I proposed such an idea uh, at the beginning of 2020, so it's a long process. Uh, we have adopted a proposal in the Commission, and then we have engaged not only um, discussions with many stakeholders, many uh, business federations or um, non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations, but we have also uh, engaged a discussion with all the member states, the 27 uh, member states in the EU, and with the European Parliament, and we are close to the end of such a process. Um, in fact, large companies uh, from all sectors must be part of the uh, change that we try to uh, put into place. They will need to identify and address possible risk of adverse impact in their own operation, as well as those seen in the operation of their subsidiaries and across their shares of activities inside and outside Europe. We try to, uh, to have a global impact concerning the activities of all those companies. They will be required to embed human rights and environmental considerations within their global chain of activities. These new rules must be mandatory, is the new main aspect of what we are doing. We are going to a, a mandatory uh, rule in order to make a substantial impact uh, on our economy and society. The existing international recommendations and voluntary frameworks are still important and represent the starting point of our initiative. But if we want to go forward, it's very important to move from a voluntary approach to a mandatory one. But we see that uh, with a voluntary approach, it's not enough to ensure that our leverage as European society is fully used to improve the living condition of people in some of those countries with which we have trade relationships. To promote the transition to a more sustainable business model, the proposed directive provides a balanced and effective legal framework uh, to uphold human rights and protect the environment. 
It's also aims at fostering the competitiveness, growth, and resilience of business because there is no contradiction in a good way to protect human rights and environment and the capacity to grow and the capacity to go to innovation and to promote business. So we want to, to show that it's possible to do both and maybe due to the protection of uh, human rights, labor rights and environmental uh, um, issues, it's very important uh, that we are going also to a, a better competitiveness for all our companies. And we call upon companies to strengthen their leadership and embrace the new model. Um, we know many have already be, been doing the, this on a voluntary basis. They were taking part in all the voluntary frameworks at the UN level or in the OECD or by uh, sectoral approaches. But now it's time to move to the mandatory approach and we expect business to benefit from uh, the new rules to increase awareness, a level playing field, better risk management, more innovation, enhance resilience and greater competitiveness. And the directive will also respond to consumers' concerns and their calls for more transparency and more sustainable products. As Commissioner for Justice, I'm sure in charge uh, of the consumer policy, and there are more and more requests from the consumers uh, to take care of the um, uh, issues and the concern that we have put at the core of this uh, proposal. It will empower them to make informed and responsible choices. We believe this will result in a virtuous sales cycle, leading to further growth and allowing companies to, to thrive. We also expect the new rules to bring multiple benefits for partner countries, uh, including better protection of human rights and the environment, better adoption of international standards, easier access to remedies for victims, and more support from uh, the European Union. The directive is designed in such a way um, as not to immediately lead EU companies to disengage from countries where conditions are less favorable. Rather, the directive fosters continuous engagement with a view to improving those conditions. So we try to have a real improvement in the partner countries and not uh, to let those countries alone without a real engagement of European companies. Termination is a measure of last resort and would be necessary only if due diligence measures do not bear fruit and only under certain conditions. Notably, this would occur in cases of severe adverse impact where the company's engagement and attempts to increase leverage in its chain of activities repeatedly, uh, repeatedly fail. So it is the responsible disengagement. So again, the first action is to improve the situation and not to uh, leave one of another partner country. Nor does the proposed directive envisage restrictions to economic activity, such as import ban that we have in other countries, like in the US. We have separate negotiations um, with uh, the European Parliament and the Council on a different regulation prohibiting products made with false labor from entering to a market. So it's a separate approach with another regulation to ban products is not the, the goal of the due diligence process. The corporate sustainability uh, due diligence directive itself mainly focuses on engagement, support, and cooperation to prevent, mitigate, and end, if it's possible, adverse impacts on human rights and the environment. It will lead companies to use their economic leverage to engage with stakeholders and bring um, about concrete change. We look forward to working further with EU trading partners to ensure maturity reinforcing initiatives are put in place. This includes not only the development of voluntary sustainability standards, but also support for multi-stakeholders alliances and industry coalitions. EU development policy and other international cooperation instruments will provide additional support. Overall, in order to achieve uh, the directive's goal, it is essential that all sectors are covered. The whole industry must be part of this change and benefit from it. It is also vital that um, rules are reasonable and proportionate. The mandatory framework must only apply to large companies and not create excessive burdens. 
The future directive will not place legal duties on small and medium-sized enterprises. The compliance burden will fall on large companies, which should have sufficient resources to bear the cost and provide support where necessary to small or medium-sized enterprises that are part of their value chain. Indirectly, it's possible to be touched, of course, in the value chain, but not as an operator concerned by the directive itself and with not the same kind of obligations that the, the large companies. The due diligence requirement will apply so to large European companies and to non-European companies with significant turnover in the EU and which therefore have a link to the EU market. So we want to have a level playing field on the EU market with all the large companies from EU and from abroad. In both cases, the full chain of activities of the companies within the scope defined by the directive will be covered. The need for such coverage stems um, from the nature of due diligence being a corporate risk and impact management um, tool. It applies no matter where the company operates and where its chain of activities is lo located. The main element is the link with the single market in the EU. This is consistent with the definitions of uh, authoritative international due diligence instruments like the OECD uh, Responsible Business Guidelines for Multinational Enterprises or the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. It is important to note that there are no new reporting requirements in the directive. We have tried to avoid any new process for um, a reporting. These were already established under the EU Directive on Corporate Sustainability Reporting, the CSRD. Companies have the right to adopt a risk-based approach and prioritize the adverse impact to be addressed. Rules on liability will only include civil responsibility and be limited to harms that could have been prevented through due diligence. Companies must be held liable for damages they could have prevented, and victims or, uh, of abuses must be able to hold companies to account and obtain remedies. So we try to uh, organize an administrative supervision on a good implementation of the due diligence process. So it will be a network of agencies and authorities in the member states. They'll be in charge to do that, to organize the supervision. But uh, about the liability, it's only a civil liability. But of course, there is a possibility for the victims to go to justice if there is no compensation for the damage caused by some violation of the environment or some uh, different kind of uh, abuse in relation with the human rights. Overall, we expect the new directive to promote a new global standard regarding the environment and human rights. And this includes the right of employed and, of, and self-employed workers to enjoy just and favorable conditions of work, including a fair wage. Uh, we have tried to discuss in the European Union about a minimum wage in the EU, and we try to see how it's possible to have at least a fair wage in all the supply chains. It also aims at ensuring safe and healthy working conditions and a reasonable limit to working hours in accordance with Article 7 and 11 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and cultural rights. So the work condition, the working conditions are very important in the process that we are putting, putting into place, not only the wage, but the conditions of the different uh, workers in the uh, entire supply chain. The EU will use its international engagement to accompany the progressive entry into force of the new rules in the chains of activities of large companies. A range of accompanying measures are being prepared to help adapt um, to the new requirements and minimize unintended effects. The European Union will also increase engagement with partner countries and regions that are developing and adopting their own rules on environmental and human rights related due diligence. I would like to stress that the timely adoption of this directive is a priority for the EU sustainability agenda. The corporate sustainability due diligence directive has enter the final stage of the legislative process. So I said that I've started the beginning of 2020, just before the start of the pandemic of COVID-19 to discuss about the 
such a proposal. And now we hope that a formal endorsement of the provisional agreement reached in mid-December between the Council in Europe, the two member states, in fact, and the Parliament will be made soon, leading to the formal adoption before the upcoming European election. So we'll have uh, a full mandate uh, since uh, the beginning of uh, 2020 uh, to organize such a process and to go to a, a final adoption. Of course, after that, it will be needed to organize the transposition into different national legislations and then to start with the companies a real implementation. So we have in front of us two, three, four years again uh, to uh, implement and to work for a real enforcement and a real implementation by all the companies. So I thank you for such an opportunity, opportunity to explain to you what we are doing Thank you for your invitation, of course, and for your attention. I hope that you will have fruitful discussions today on all those topics, but I'm sure that we have to continue to work with like-minded partners like the US uh, to uh, go forward in such a way, so to protect more and more the environment and to pay more and more attention to uh, human rights and also to the labor rights and the working conditions, not only in the companies, but in their subsidiaries and in their supply chains. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rangers. Well, Commissioner, if you have if you have two or three more minutes, we'd yeah. uh, we'd like to put a couple of questions to you. Um, one's one's uh, what we call a softball. One's one's a hardball. Uh, the softball question is: You talked about firms beginning to embrace uh, the model. Is that um, is that is that true too for American firms? We have lots of lots of uh, U.S. firms. In the room, have they played a role in the in 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 the in the shaping of the directive? That's the softball. <laughs> the hardball is where does uh, where does China fit in? Um, and is there? I mean, here in the U.S., we're we're, we're obsessed with um, China. Can you talk a little bit about uh, about how the directive deals with China, if 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 differently at all? No, we we will apply the same rules for all the the companies coming from abroad. Of course. I know that they are more concerned in the different cases, but just to give you an example, uh, if we have some uh, European or American companies having a part of their supply chain in China, it's fine, it's possible, but maybe if it's uh, in one specific province, there is a risk of false labor. And so if it's the case, we'll ask to take initiatives and to take uh, measures to fight against that. And Again, uh, there are two different ways. In the um, due diligence process, it will be possible to try to uh, take measures to stop such a kind of process to use false labor. And we are working on another kind of uh, legislative instrument uh, to ban product, including false labor, from all market. I know that in the US there is already an instrument to do that, but we are working on it. For the rest, we will apply the same rules to Chinese companies having a part uh, of activities in Europe that depends from the turnover in Europe, like we'll do that with companies coming from the US. But to give you an example, is what we are doing about data protection. Uh, we have um, uh, the GDPR, so the general uh, regulation on data protection, and we apply the rules to all the actors when they are in contact with uh, the European Union or the uh, single market. But it's true that uh, we will have to be very attentive to uh, the full implementation of such a kind of process, not only in the uh, European companies or U US companies having activity in Europe, but also when we'll have Chinese companies having activities on our territories. But you know that we are marking more and more to the economic uh, security in Europe. And we are taking a lot of measures to control the um, development of investment in the EU and the way to organize a participation in the single market for some companies coming from uh, also China. Uh, thank you. And the and the, the embrace of, of US firms, have you felt that? Uh, of course, we, we are doing the job in the relation with the single market. So what we want to do is not to have an extraterritorial effect of our uh, legislative initiative. Uh, I led the extraterritoriality to other partners. They have more the tradition to do that. Uh, in Europe, we are working uh, on the fact that there is a link with the single market. So all the operators having an activity in the uh, European market need to apply to implement the new rules. That's the goal. So we want to have a level playing field. And that explains that we are also moving from a voluntary to a mandatory approach. Because till now, I know that there were uh, some 
Europeans or US companies having uh, had the tradition to implement the guidelines from the UN or the guidelines from the OECD. But of course, here we'll apply the rules for all the participants, all the large companies. So it's a level playing field, not only between all the European companies, but between all the companies having an activity in the single market. And it's the reason why, of course, we will take on board the US companies. I have discussed a lot with uh, different chambers of commerce, with different uh, uh, association of uh, businesses from the US about that. And uh, it's the reason why, so we were very attentive to don't add uh, additional uh, to not have additional reporting processes. I know that there are many concerns about um, the uh, administrative burden of such uh, reporting, and we are using the existing reporting, so the so-called CSRD, the Corporate Sustainable uh, Reporting Directive. Good. Well, we we appreciate your time, Commissioner Reinders. We know you've got a you've got uh, other things to do. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, you very much. To do. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have a lot of things to do in Europe too, yeah? Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>